Boulder had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad afternoon. Small wildfire, water main break, and a sinkhole. Aurora's reformer police chief is fired, but the city can't get out of the court order to change its police practices. Frontier has an idea to make boarding planes at DIA go faster by having you stand outside to do it. And a class exploring some old time technology finds a fellow fan. At first I was like, yeah, Tom Hanks, that guy. Yeah, that guy, indeed. On next. Man, Boulder had a day, a wildfire, a water main break, and a sinkhole all within an hour this afternoon. Everything now seems under control. The fire, the largest concern on a windy day, was quickly contained shortly after hikers were evacuated from the Shanahan Trailhead, south of the end car fire burn scar. Across town, what was likely a water main break flooded Arapaho and Commerce streets and caused a sinkhole that caught an RTD bus. Police say everybody got off the bus and was not hurt. Aurora Police Chief Vanessa Wilson is out, fired after two years of trying to reform that department. Her moves made some powerful enemies. She fired an officer found passed out drunk in his car on duty, fired officers who joked about the death of Elijah McLean, fired the union leader who suggested Aurora Police hire crackheads to represent the diversity of the community. Chief Wilson became a frequent target of the new conservative majority on Aurora City Council. One council member recently called her trash. And this morning, she was fired. City Manager Jim Twombly announced the move a day after a report was released on a records backlog within the city police department. A report from a Florida-based consulting firm called PRI Management Group. CEO of PRI is a guy named Edward Clawton. And uh, not difficult to find the posts on his LinkedIn page showing his political perspective on policing and society. Calling for people to stand up to wokeism and discrimination against corporations. Telling Americans to wake up, take a stand, vote them out. Elijah McLean's mom said publicly today that she is alarmed by the firing. Now Aurora City Manager will appoint an interim police chief as they search for a new permanent chief. Anybody stepping into Aurora Police Department will need to fulfill the consent decree. It's a legally binding agreement that requires the department to make changes when it comes to the use of force. It was put in place following the death of Elijah McLean after his struggle with Aurora police officers. The man hired to oversee the consent decree told our Katie Eastman the leadership change should not stop the progress. Everything that happens in Aurora is being closely watched by a company in Florida called IntegraSure and their president, Jeff Schlanger. We have been following and have been kept apprised of uh, the, uh, the departure of Chief Wilson for about the last um, three or four weeks. On February 14th, Schlanger was hired as the independent consent decree monitor for the city of Aurora. This oversight comes after an investigation by the attorney general found Aurora police engaged in excessive force practices and racially biased policing. So far, uh, they are doing well. Um, that is not to say that we have measured with respect to any of the mandates, but the cooperation that we have gotten uh, thus far from the city and from uh, both APD and AFR has really been exemplary. Schlanger credits the now former police chief, Vanessa Wilson, with much of that cooperation. But he doesn't believe her firing will disrupt the progress. He was the Los Angeles Police Department's monitor for nine years. The consent decrees that I have been the monitor for, in which chiefs have departed, have ended up being extremely successful, notwithstanding that departure. Whether or not Wilson should have been fired, that's something Schlanger won't comment on. We will proceed without missing a beat. At least that's the hope. Time will tell. And Schlanger and members of his team have visited Aurora before. They'll be here again for a community forum on April 19th. Kyle, that'll give people a chance to ask them questions about how this works. It can be confusing. And obviously, whoever the next chief is, they step into the exact same political environment. They do. And I asked the consent decree monitor, does that impact his job? He says they stay out of politics. The consent decree is an apolitical document. Katie, thank you. Erie has a new mayor and a race that attracted outside money and a discussion about oil and gas interests. We told you about this last night. Justin Brooks 
won anyway when they tallied the votes late last evening. He said that the outside groups were looking for a rollback of oil and gas drilling restrictions, which is an idea that he opposes. It was a tight race. The unofficial election night tallies show that Brooks defeated Kelly Zuniga 52 to 48 percent. Colorado's new 8th Congressional District from the north side of the metro area up into northern Colorado is expected to be one of the most competitive districts in America. The Democratic nomination is now set and Republicans are headed for a large primary. Democratic State Rep. Dr. Yadira Caraveo will be the Democratic nominee after a progressive candidate, Adams County Commissioner Chaz Tedesco, fell just short of making the ballot. So Caraveo avoids a potentially expensive primary and can now save her money for the general election. There are four Republicans who have made their primary ballot. Weld County Commissioner Lori Sane, State Senator Barbara Kirkmeyer, Army Special Forces veteran Tyler Elkhorn, and Thornton Mayor Jan Coleman in left to right order. I would bet that a fair number of you out there are familiar with the work of Ralston House. That's the nonprofit where kids go after they have been abused or after they've witnessed violence. The place where trained, compassionate experts help them share the details of their story, both to find justice and to begin healing. It's where kids in our community go after they suffer the unthinkable. The head of Ralston House told me recently, someday we won't be busy and that will be wonderful. They have been busier than ever in the last year. That's why this week's Word of Thanks microgiving campaign supports the work of Ralston House. Children who are sexually abused or who witness a crime in Jefferson, Adams, Broomfield, or Gilpin County come here. More than a thousand kids a year. And that is where the investigation, the conversation begins with care, with genuine empathy, and with the expertise of Ralston House staff. And when young people leave Ralston House, they add a marble to the jar to remind them that they are not alone in what they've gone through. Also serves as a reminder to us about how many children need our help to be safe. And that's what this is really about. It's about what we as adults in the community can do to help keep kids safe. Ralston House says that a wave of reports of abuse and trauma came out after the pandemic. And it makes sense because children now have all kinds of safe places like school and sports activities and back to church where they can report what may be happening behind closed doors elsewhere. Ralston House is there to listen and to help. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 and I'll send you that link to donate. As always, I'll match the first 50 donations of $5 to get us started. We have to give a quick disclosure this week. Our Marshall Zellinger is on Ralston House's board, which is why I put together this Word of Thanks campaign behind Marshall's back. Together, we can support the Coloradans at Ralston House who listen and who take action to help abuse children in our community. Everything's so calm with COVID these days. We are in full on move on mode. A look across the Atlantic gives us an idea what's next. You know, Red Rocks can only host so many shows, so a new outdoor place for music is being built to the south. And students experimenting with Asian technology connect with a famous fan of the same stuff. Next. By the end of the month, Colorado will close a third of the state-run COVID-19 testing sites. The health department says current demand for testing is real low, fewer than 2,500 tests per day on average. It's like 5% of their testing capacity. So the first site to close will be Waterworld on Friday. COVID is not top of mind for a lot of us these days. Isn't that wonderful? The people whose job it is to be vigilant are watching the UK, where the COVID trends tend to start two weeks before they merge in the US. Anusha Roy tells us what they're seeing. PDPHE is watching Germany, Italy, Netherlands, and the UK to help model what could happen here. The UK is probably most similar to us in terms of the spectrum of vaccination rate. UK reached record levels of infections with the help of the BA2 variant, the subvariant of Omicron. And those that have some level of immunity or protection through vaccination, we seem to see a lot milder course with this. Hospitalizations and deaths are going up, but at lower rates than earlier this year. So far, we dodged the bullet. Jonathan Salmon is the dean of Colorado School of Public Health that models COVID. And even though the same variant now makes up around half of the cases in Colorado, with that number expected to go up, we are not following the UK's trajectory right now. Would we have seen a change in cases at this point? About the point where we would expect to start seeing that, 
you know, turn upward if it's going to happen. So what's the difference? It's more than vaccines, but natural immunity, too. We did experience an awful lot of people who became infected with Omicron and perhaps more than took place in some other countries. We're in this nice little zone right now. Now, could that change? Yes. And Dr. Michelle Barron said timing could be a big factor if variant cases continue to go up over the next several months. Immunity potentially waning for those that maybe had Omicron in January or February. Um, we have, if our vaccination booster rate and just vaccination rate stays still, then you have a bigger proportion of people now that are going to be vulnerable to this. The hope, though, is more people would recover at home and our hospital systems would be okay. Well, perhaps not as protected against infection as we would like to be. We certainly have a high rate of protection against uh, severe disease. Also, with a lot of people testing at home now, we may not really actually have the full picture of how many people have COVID right now. The models, however, preliminary in Colorado show that if we did see an uptick, that could be happening in the next couple of weeks. But really, Kyle, it would be a muted uptick versus what we've seen in the past, especially mm -hmm. for the people who are falling the most sick. But, you know, the experts are saying they're just going to kind of watch the next couple of weeks and, and see what happens here. I honestly love not having to worry about this every day. Awesome. And, the, and the only thing that I really want to know is like, when does the advice change? Right. And at this point, they're saying the advice is kind of the same as what we've been hearing over the last couple of weeks, right? Just assess your personal risk, see what's the best for you of how you want to live with COVID and then just go forth. Yes. It's amazing. Right. Thank I you. love saying that. Thank you, Nusha. Sunny, windy, and chilly today with afternoon highs below average in the mid 40s will trend warmer heading into Thursday afternoon, but still dealing with gusty northwest winds blowing from 30 to 40 miles per hour with gusts to 60. All part of a weather system that is spinning in the northern plains. We've got high pressure coming in behind it, and that gradient is tight. Not a lot of moisture. We'll have a few high clouds late tonight and tomorrow, so a clear night, a sunny day tomorrow, and maybe a little less wind. Still dealing with red flag warnings, fire weather warnings, humidity values to 12%, and those high wind warnings continue in eastern Colorado as well. A calmer day on Thursday afternoon, a warmer day, opening day, sunshine with a forecast high of 65, upper 70s to kick off the weekend. Frontier Airlines wants to add a boarding space at the airport Outside Concourse A, 14 gates outdoors where you would walk across the tarmac to board your plane. Frontier says it would be faster. City Council would need to approve the idea. Personally, I'm looking forward to Frontier's $15 upcharge to shovel you a path through the snow to your plane or the $5 fee to rent an umbrella to board on a rainy day. I, there are so many people that pick on Frontier, and I don't get it because, face it, flying has gotten boring. I've never once taken a flight where I had to you know, spin the prop to start the plane or was asked to hold a box of squawking chickens on my lap for the duration of the flight. I'm looking forward to that kind of rugged aviation adventure, and I am confident that Frontier is headed in that direction. I'm not going to do anything that's not over the top. Colorado's newest outdoor music venue is under construction. Some are calling it Red Rock South. This is the one from Tom Hanks, actually. Um, so, of course, it's called Tom. The odd and completely charming connection between Tom Hanks and some students in Longmont. Next. Red Rocks was built in large part by nature. Colorado's next big outdoor music venue will be more human than nature in origin. I want to show you artist renderings of the sunset. A new outdoor music coliseum being built off I-25 next to the Air Force Academy. A $40 million venue with capacity for about 8,000 people, nearly the size of Red Rocks. The, de the developer smartly says, though, he is not trying to compete with the legendary venue. I'm not building this to be competitive with Red Rocks or to, to be competitive with, with anybody. I'm building it to be complementary to them, to the music culture and to the arts culture. And, um, I'm at a point in my life where I can, I can do that. And so I want it to be something that the community enjoys um, and in no way trying to be competitive with, with Denver. I just, Colorado Springs doesn't have anything quite like this. The plan is to open the sunset by September 2023 with the idea of having a full schedule of touring bands for the summer of 2024. 
The clacking sounds coming from a classroom at St. Vrain Community Montessori in Longmont is an intentionally tactile learning experience, one that just happened to connect the class with a famous American. Photojournalist journalist Mike Grady has the story. I don't know what that button does. Typewriters may seem a bit out of place in a 21st century middle school classroom. Where do you go, button? Luckily, Courtney Pomeroy Look, Evelyn. is here to teach. So this right here. How they work. These right here are attached to the ribbon spools that are up top. It's a way for the students to really deep dive into what they're typing and what they're writing to be very mindful. Pressing down each key and it's like, boom. You're, you're making something. Eighth grader Ashley Berkowitz appreciates St. Vrain Community Montessori School incorporating these tools into the curriculum. Our kids have had so much fun naming our typewriters. We've got Olympia, which is an Olympia typewriter. Is it McKelzedek, McKeezit? I don't even know how to pronounce that one. But the machine Berkowitz is punching away on stands out. This is the one from Tom Hanks actually, so of course it's called Tom. At the beginning of the school year, the class watched a typewriter documentary featuring the two-time Oscar winner. We were like, do you know who Tom Hanks is? Like, besides being in the documentary, and they're like, yeah, it's Woody from Toy Story. <laughs> and we're like, yeah, and also like lots of other things. After a quick IMDB lesson, Pomeroy figured she'd reach out. I decided that I would try and type a letter to Tom Hanks. Hanks responded with yes. more than just words. This is the first letter we got back from Tom Hanks. Hi, Courtney, please contact me to arrange sending the school a typewriter named Tom. I'm typing on a typewriter that Tom Hanks used to own, and that's interesting. Tom seems to fit in just fine in this new environment, helping these students grow. So we're learning how to use these typewriters, who created them, how, why, to better serve us and teach us about humanity, about ourselves. For next. So, yeah, that's pretty sweet. I'm Mike Grady. Since the story was first shared in the Longmont Times call, that school has had 15 additional typewriters donated by people in the community. Colorado's young people have more opportunities these days to come forward to report abuse. Thank goodness for that. And thank goodness for the Coloradans who are there to help them and for what we can do tonight to help them in their work. That and your feedback next. Colorado, Colorado's opioid epidemic has had a side effect for children. The folks at Ralston House say that it puts young people at an additional risk of abuse because you've got people buying and selling drugs coming in and out of houses where kids live and sometimes abusing the children there. The head of Ralston House is telling me about one young girl in a dangerous situation who put a stay out sign on her door, her best attempt to keep dangerous people out of her safe place. Ralston House is the place where children go for interviews after they report abuse or witness a crime at Jeffco, Adams County, Broomfield, Gilpin. It's a safe place full of trained and caring adults who know how to talk to kids about what's happened in their lives. You scan the QR code on your screen or text word thanks to 303-871-1491 to join me in donating to this week's Word of Thanks campaign in support of Ralston House. Uh, in your feedback tonight about Frontier's idea about adding outdoor boarding at DIA, Tim writes, blank, son, that was some rough justice for Frontier. But everybody at home was shaking their head in agreement. Oh, it's never 100%, Tim. See you next time.